this congregation. We are so grateful for both him and for Beth and their presence here among us. Uh, a rich sense of uh, theological commitment, a uh, commitment to God's people, to God's church, and also to the work of racial justice and particularly the work of um, uh, uh, the work of justice in general, and particularly the work of racial justice in uh, our community. So, without further ado, it is my privilege to uh, to welcome Dr. Stiver. Yes, please. Are there some masks? <clears throat> oh no, no problem. Uh, yeah, we will get you a mask. Okay. Sure, no problem. Come, come on up. It's a privilege uh, to be with you and before you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a blessing to be part of this church. And I want to say, as Pastor Ryan said, we, we joined during the summer of 20 or fall of 2020 um, during the pandemic when the church was not meeting in person. And I have to say that was the first time we've ever joined a church online before and actually I don't know if any of you recall the pastor interviewed Beth and I and then played it Sunday morning so as you all probably are familiar with the way Baptists join the church a lot walking forward being introduced briefly say hi <laughs> uh, that was the most extensive introduction we've ever had uh, in joining a church but uh, we have enjoyed and appreciated this church so much and it's great to be up here representing uh, the justice committee the act council and especially our education subcommittee that meets almost every week um, that that has been great and uh, our sunday school class the ragamuffin class that's been really special we got to know them we felt very intimately over a year on Zoom before we actually had ever met any of them in person. And that was really special when we were able to do that. So um, it's been a journey with you. And before I uh, get into a lot of this that I'm going to go over fairly uh, quickly because I want to have some time for a discussion at the end around the tables and um, and then in the, the large group uh, but uh, first a part a part of my journey so what I want to talk about this morning is a divorce that happened in American history in US history and that is part of the background and tradition of many of us especially we might say broadly of white evangelicals, uh, conservative Christianity, um, and Southern Baptist. So the divorce I want to talk about, there are several actually, but the one I want to talk about this morning is a divorce between justice and righteousness, between talking about justice and evangelism, justice and missions, justice and the gospel, justice in the kingdom of God, justice in discipleship, justice in following Christ, all of those things. The way we're brought up typically at first is the way we think everybody's brought up and the way we think is the way everyone thinks and we might think that's the way all Christians of all times have thought. And what's startling, it was for me anyway, what's startling is to find out that our way may be somewhat unique. It may be um, particular and not universal. And I think that's true of my background, the background perhaps of many of you. This split between justice and the gospel often is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It was a long time coming and there are reasons, significant reasons behind it. So we might think of the passage of scripture, what God has put together, let not humans put asunder. 
And what I want to talk about then is the way our, my tradition, the tradition of many of us, has pulled together something that I'm pretty confident in saying is together in the Bible. So, the question is, can Humpty Dumpty be put back together again after Humpty Dumpty has fallen and smashed into a lot of pieces? And that is a big question. So, uh, to begin, a philosopher I like uh, at Yale Divinity School, Nicholas Wolterstorff, wrote a big book called Justice. And in fact, one of the sections in his book is called De-Justicizing the New Testament. And he talks about some of the history of how these got pulled apart. And one of the examples is this, and it's an interesting thing that, as he points out, in most languages, the translation of the Bible of verses like I have here translates them the way they're translated here. English is about the only one that translates it the way you probably have ringing in your mind, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now he said, I haven't checked every language, but in virtually all the other languages he knew, it's justice, and I checked the few that I know, <laughs> and that's true. So what is the import of that? And I could ask you, how, how does this change things for you to see it translated like this? One of the problems that makes it worse is that it wouldn't be so bad if we had a biblical meaning of righteousness. But that is a word that got changed, a concept that got changed in this history I'm talking about. And as, as David Grable mentioned last week, righteousness, spirituality, holiness became, in our context, very privatized, very individualized, very personalized. And that is pretty far from the biblical notion, which, as we'll see, is almost synonymous with justice. Now, the good thing is the word justice has not been so distorted. It actually has the connotations and the ring that I think it has in the Bible but not righteousness. So there's a reason why these words are translated as righteousness. And it ends up giving us a distorted picture of what actually the verse means. Now I grew up um, hearing all the time that Baptists are people of the book. And the Bible, you know, is our authority and our guide. And I've sometimes wondered, what if we had grown up with the right translations of a lot of these passages? You know, maybe, would it have made a difference if we read it right there in the Bible? Um, if we had read, like in Romans, that Phoebe was a deacon, um, that Junia was chief among the apostles, would, would it have made a difference? I think it might. And uh, I, I, I was hard on my upbringing. I grew up outside of Springfield, Missouri, in a little country church, Southern Baptist Church. And uh, a lot of these things weren't even talked about, but they were caught in the air. Like, I don't even remember people talking about the fact that women could not be pastors, but somehow I knew it and assumed it and never thought otherwise for quite quite a while. But they also taught me, it should be fair to say, that God was the most important thing, that the Bible is God's word. I should put the Bible above tradition, check tradition by the Bible. I should read the Bible. I should study the Bible. Now they might have made a mistake when they did that. Uh, because over time, and when I went to the Bible, I found out that a lot of things I expected to find there were really not there, and that it was different 
than I expected on a lot of ways, and this, this is one of them. So, I think it's pretty fair to say that if we translated almost every time you come across righteousness in the New Testament, if you would substitute justice, you will be closer to the meaning. It will be more accurate. So you could say blessed are those who hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall be satisfied. Now, another step. If any of you have ever had the chance to have like a Bible class in a school, a university, seminary, study the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, you probably, probably one of the first things that you will come across is Hebrew parallelism. And that is the idea that in the Hebrew Bible, poetry was not so much rhyming as we think of it, but it was often restating things, saying something one way and then saying, basically, saying it again in a very close way, almost synonymous way. Uh, you might think of a passage, many of you probably know from Psalms 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So it's saying the same thing in a slightly different way. And that's what we find, uh, especially in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament with justice and righteousness. You say it one way and then you say it another way. So, for example, the famous chapter in Amos and passage in Amos, let justice throw down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Another example in Psalm, may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. And this happens over and over again, as I mentioned here, 30 times. And uh, you know, one way to put them together is our idea of social justice. Now again, when I was growing up, social justice was a negative. That's what liberal churches did. It was taking your eye off the ball of evangelism, and missions. It wasn't just that it was um, an option, uh, a minor alternative, it's that it was positively negative. The focus should be on evangelism and missions. Unfortunately, what often happened is, of course, from the evangelical perspective, the mainline churches were the liberal churches. That's not, that's often they're referred to that way. I think it's not a very good characterization. But mainline churches sometimes fell into this divorce and they would be negative about evangelism. And that would just make it worse. And part of the problem is then evangelism, like righteousness, was often understood in a very narrow way. Um, a very distorted way, very partial way. So often dis evangelism and discipleship, evangelism was to have someone make a profession of faith, and then discipleship was to get someone else to make a profession of faith. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Now occasionally there would be a little more to it, being righteous, and that was often focused on a few notorious sins that you didn't do, and a few things that you did do. Go to church, read the Bible, be nice to people like you, you're righteous. Uh, in the past, of course, the sin was don't drink, don't dance, don't play cards. Everything they did at the saloon at the other end of town, don't do with the church at the opposite end of town. And that was righteousness. Now again, we'll see there was a reason why it went that direction. Another step, in the Hebrew Bible especially, you find over and over attention to these categories. In the prophets, that when God is concerned about people, or in Amos, when God is holding up a plumb line, as he put it, some of you may know what that is, hold up a string, see if the wall's straight. 
when God is holding up a plumb line to society, it's how we treat the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the resident aliens, or sojourners, depending on your translation. Those appear together often, over and over, many times. Uh, once I mentioned in James in the New Testament, which is that most Hebrew of New Testament epistles. Um, for Amos, authentic uh, to, to be concerned about what God is current, concerned about is basically two things, authentic worship and justice. How one treats the widow, the orphan, the poor. And I think what we could say is what they're getting at are the most vulnerable in society. Who are the most vulnerable in society? Then, and in a lot of ways, still today. That's what God is concerned about. That's what justice is about. And for Amos, actually, there isn't authentic worship unless there's justice. In that passage uh, in Amos 5, he says God actually hates our singing, hates our worship, detests it, unless we are also doing justice. We also know, and this is significant, that Jesus was especially influenced by the prophets. That of the Hebrew Bible traditions, he especially, from what we have in the Gospels, he especially drew upon the prophets and, interestingly, the wisdom tradition. Hence, the parables, the aphorisms, the way that he taught. And interestingly, exorcism was a part of the wisdom tradition. <laughs> and so exorcism was part of his ministry. But his uh, hermeneutic, we could say, which is a fancy word for saying his way of approaching the Bible, seemed to be to look especially at the prophets, that they were the guide to how you look at it. So another passage representative of this do not oppress the widow the orphan the alien or the poor and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another now to jump to the new testament the magnificat mary's song mary's praise after the annunciation luke has that there for a reason what is this all about what is um, Mary giving birth to Christ all about? This is one of the first strong emphases that we have. And this is part of it. You have this poor peasant woman <laughs> ringing out like the prophets of old. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. That's what her baby was about. Her being pregnant was about, as she understood it, as we have in Luke's gospel. And then, as we learn a little bit from Pastor Ryan's sermon last week, Jesus' first sermon, his inaugural sermon, um, quoting from Isaiah, which was one of his favorite prophets, apparently. He quoted extensively, drew heavily, Upon Isaiah, who talks about the kingdom of God a lot. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to pro proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Which many think that he was announcing the year of Jubilee from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, a time after 49 years when uh, land that had been sold would be restored to the original owner and justice would be done throughout the land. Now it wasn't always practiced or maybe never really practiced but there's a thought that the people heard him actually announcing this that this is a, what he's about. So the first chance we have really to get an idea of what Jesus is about is this. Now as uh, Pastor Ryan mentioned last week the sermon did not go well. Um, they ended up taking him out and trying to throw him off a cliff. So, now part of that was because he started, he went from the sermon to messing around with people and saying that maybe Naaman, their great Assyrian, their great enemy, 
might be more favorable to God than they are, and so that will upset them. But is there any indication that after the sermon didn't go well that Jesus said, okay, forget that, I'm dropping that theme, and I'm going to now just preach about things that don't offend people, personal things, private things that don't what cause waves, don't cause trouble, like what happened in our tradition to righteousness. Is there any indication that he did that? Good, good. Audience response there. No, <laughs> there isn't. And in fact, we know he was executed by the Roman government because they saw him as a threat. Um, now, before we get into the history part quickly, I want to talk about an issue that makes this so much more difficult, and that is implicit bias, we could call it, or the fact that we all have biases, and maybe a more neutral way to put it is we all have presuppositions, we all have pre-understandings, you could say. It's not necessarily a terrible thing. It's a good thing we don't have to think through every move we make at every moment, we, we would be paralyzed. We wouldn't be able to do anything. But it's probably not surprising in a broken world, a fallen world, or I like the way C.S. Lewis put it in one of his, in his science fiction trilogy, in a bent world, a world that is bent and distorted, that we would have biases that are not helpful. There are presuppositions that can be helpful and, and good, and that's what part of our transformation into the image of Christ is about, is helping us to have the right pre-understandings. But we often do not. And the biases we have are often deeply rooted in our childhood, our early training, our early formation, and they are very deep. There are enormous amounts of studies now done of bias, and they show over and over that we are very biased. And we are very good at protecting our biases. In fact, cognitive scientists and, and others say that it's about 5 to 10% of our brain activity is conscious. The rest is unconscious. Now, we're not talking about the Freudian unconscious that's full of a seething cauldron of illicit desires. Now, there might be some of those, but for the most part, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, now, what's called the new unconscious is that this is a part of normal functioning. Just think about speaking and talking. Isn't it amazing when you want to say something, the words just appear? They used to. <laughs> Um, sometimes words you don't want to appear come too, and that comes from the unconscious. But if, if, if you've had uh, the chance to study another language, you know when you don't know a language well and you're trying to say something, you have to stop. And you go, okay, well, what's that word? <laughs> what is that word? And let's see, how do I say it? How does it go? How do the noun and verbs go together? In what order? And, and all that kind of thing. And if you have to do that, you know you don't know the language very well. It's only when it, all of that work is done behind the scenes, and then it's just there for you. That's, that's the good work of the unconscious. But that's where our biases reside as well, and they affect our body and our emotions. And in fact, uh, the studies where they put electrodes on the skin or brain scans show that a lot of times our responses to things happen before to happen to our body and our emotions before our conscious mind gets engaged, like a split second before. So by the time sometimes that we're aware of things, that we're aware we're feeling this way or we're responding this way, we're already down the road. And our typical response is when we're already feeling a certain way, responding a certain way, is that we go with it. What's hard is to stop it and to say, oh, oh no, that's not the, the way to respond. Even if we do respond well 
we can have discomfort. We can struggle with it a bit. And so part of what I'm wanting to say is even if we're all on board with this and some of this, a lot of this is not new to you and you embrace it, it's possible you may still have some discomfort when we're talking about justice so much. And we might be thinking, well, what about evangelism? <laughs> and, how, and what about righteousness? The thing is, um, that, that's something to push against, I think. But it's also something to bring from us some understanding and compassion. Perhaps for ourselves, for others around us, for other churches, maybe some of our family members and friends, and to realize that we're bucking up against something that's pretty strong and deep within us in terms of this split. Now, it's probably good to say here, too, that there really isn't a choice. That's to fall in to the same mistake and say, okay, well, we've been interested in evangelism. Now let's get interested in justice and leave that behind. In the Bible, I think it's fair to say they're not separated. Evangelism, discipleship is deeply intertwined and integrated with justice. They're not different things altogether. That's, that's a really significant thing to get. So we're more biased than we think. Bias is more difficult to overcome than we think. In fact, it can take a lifetime in some ways to retrain ourselves, to reform ourselves on a lot of these things. Okay, now to the history. Um, you historians out there, uh, don't, don't uh, faint that I'm doing this really quickly. <laughs> It's a complex story, but to simplify, how did we get to where we are? And why is it that it's this way? A first issue is just simply slavery. Centuries of slavery. Centuries of slavery based on race. Centuries of slavery based on white supremacy. People that were engaged in that were Christians. They were deacons. They were pastors. They were leaders in government. They were highly respected people who were seen as righteous, holy, good people, highly respected. Now, how can you do that when you go to start reading the Bible? in passages like we've just looked at. It's not easy. Something has to give. A uh, long time ago, I learned in psychology classes about cognitive dissonance, the idea that people don't deal well with cognitive dissonance, uh, where we have contrary beliefs or contrary evidence, and we have a strong tendency to try to assimilate it, try to make put it together, maybe drop one and keep the other or put them together in some way. So supposedly people don't deal well with cognitive dissonance. Now over the years I've noticed that maybe people deal with it better than I thought, <laughs> that sometimes we do hold contradictory beliefs together. But generally it is uncomfortable. And you can imagine that when you are reading the Bible and you're reading that God loves all people, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, that all people are in the image of God. They were all one race, essentially. Um, God so loved the world. In Christ, there's neither male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free. And then at church, read that, emphasize the Ten Commandments, and go home and break up families, sell a husband, a wife, children, and think it's okay and feel okay. They probably wouldn't say it, but actually we can look back and say treat slaves harshly, roughly, and think it's okay. 
Something's got to give. And something did. So first of all, this split between justice and righteousness is one of the things that gave. So one of the impetuses behind privatizing morality and making it irrelevant for the most part to this uh, social system, the social structure. Why do people today, evangelicals particularly, have such visceral response when you talk about systemic racism? Right. Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> it doesn't fit because we've been trained, we've been shaped, we've been formed for centuries to be able to block out something that makes us feel guilty like that or uncomfortable. It's not really surprising, is it, that when you have centuries of living with that, that it would begin gradually to alter the way we look at the Bible, the way we approach the Bible, the way we think about discipleship, the way we think about the gospel. One of the things um, involved with implicit bias is that uh, there's a strong element of what is called confirmation bias. That is, when we have an idea, we have a very strong tendency to come up with rationalizations <laughs> to defend it. And one of the sobering things uh, I ran across is one study, and it showed that people strongly do this. All people do this. But they thought, well, maybe we'll get a bunch of people with uh, a lot of education together, higher IQ. And we'll give them the test and see how they do. They ended up doing just the same as everybody else. Except they came up with more elaborate rationalizations. <laughs> and that's what happened. We come up with a lot of rationalizations to how to um, separate ourselves from something that on the surface would seem contradictory, would be dissonant with, let's say, slavery. And then there was another century, of course, of segregation in Jim Crow laws. Centuries this was in the making. So one aspect of this that's kind of a long story is a hermeneutic developed. I'm provocatively calling it here a slavery hermeneutic. But a hermeneutic developed in this context that was ingeniously formed and designed to help you go to the Bible, find what you want, and go away with it with little challenge. Now part of that was the idea that you interpret in the Bible the obscure by the clear. That's an ancient hermeneutical principle. It's not terribly bad, but then if you combine that with the idea the Bible is very clear, and it's a tight package. It's all very, what it says here, it says everywhere else. It's often called a flat Bible approach to the Bible. So what that means, if you have a bias, you go to the Bible, you find your verse that's clear to you, and then you really don't even have to look at the rest of the Bible because you know it all has to agree with what is clear to you. <laughs> At the time of the Civil War, Mark Knoll is a prominent evangelical historian, and he says probably 80% or so uh, of the U.S. had that hermeneutic. And he concludes that the pro-slavery Christians won the biblical battle hands down because of that hermeneutic. Now, after the Civil War, Civil War, and, and I should say, if you ever think hermeneutic is ir hermeneutics are, is irrelevant or doesn't matter, just think about the Civil War. Um, after the Civil War, the mainline churches largely moved away from that hermeneutic, but not the evangelicals, not the conservative churches. And I should say, as he says, it didn't change because of biblical arguments. It changed because of force of arms. That's why it changed. 
But among conservative Christians, especially in the South, as you might imagine, that hermeneutic continued to this very day. In the bibliography, you might see there, that's traced by others. George Marston is an evangelical historian that traces it through the 19th and early 20th centuries. Christian Smith, in his book called The Bible Made Impossible, is a good book on tracing it to this, this day. The students that come uh, to Logson Seminary, they have, by and large, almost always this hermeneutic. It's still with us and all around us, and it makes it possible to go to the Bible and find what you want to find and go away and say, that's what the Bible says, very easily. And it's not just about justice and righteousness, the split we're talking about. It relates to women in ministry. It relates to LGBTQ issues. It makes it very difficult to have real biblical discussion. So that's one part of this story. How am I doing? Second part is about a century ago, there was a great fundamentalist liberal controversy, again, between conservative churches and uh, mainline denominations. And uh, part of the result of that was especially this social justice evangelism split. So that's very much a part of why when I was growing up, I was thinking, well, that's what the liberal churches do. They're interested in social justice. Uh, conservative churches are interested in evangelism. This relates to the evangel uh, relates to also the all political political split. So that for a long time, when I was growing up, the idea is well, you don't the church shouldn't be involved in politics. Shouldn't talk about politics. I don't ever remember even the word justice being mentioned in church growing up. Um, that's very convenient if you're a group that's more in the majority, if you're a group that has more social power. That's very convenient. Don't mess with the system. And that's also a reason why you don't want to talk about there being a problem of systemic problems, especially when righteousness is all very personal, moral, uh, individualistic. Now, third part is more recently with the 1980s, Jerry Falwell, moral majority, there was a kind of return of white evangelicals to be interested in politics, as we know very well. But often the interest in justice now is very narrow, focused on a few issues, and they're often self-serving issues. So the thing is usually, unless you are a very oppressed people, if you're interested in justice, it's usually not so much for yourself. It's <clears throat> to help, as we talked about, those most vulnerable in society. To help others, not, not so much oneself. So, uh, last quotation from the book uh, that uh, Pastor Ryan did is a, a book discussion uh, from Robert Jones, White Too Long. Because of the existing conditions of inequality, late 20th century white Christian theology didn't necessarily need to actively work against African-American civil rights, although it did this too. Rather, its most powerful tool was its ability to constrict radically the scope of white's moral vision. So that's what we've been talking about. Um, we can put together um, all of these things, and I, I'm pretty confident in saying in a more biblical way, um, and have, our, our goal is to have an unconstricted moral vision, a fuller moral vision, actually a biblical moral vision. So takeaways, right at the end, to seek justice is to pursue the kingdom of God, to follow Jesus to be evangelistic, to be interested in missions, to be, in short, biblical. Transforming our distorted biases takes time and is hard work. But that's like our transformation into the image of Christ anyway, isn't it? Which is a lifelong process of gradually, as we look upon Jesus' face, to be transformed into the image of Christ. 
And in the end, it is to be blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. It's there. Okay, I wasn't sure we got this slide on here. So right now, one thing you can do if you're really nifty at these QR codes, um, there's some follow-up uh, opportunities for more information. If you go uh, to this code, and it, you may have a sheet on your table where you can look at the first one on your left, and that's this one to do these follow-up questions. What I'd like now is to have some discussion at your table. So the first question is, in light of how you were raised in terms of the relationship of justice in the gospel, justice and righteousness, what we've been talking about, how does seeing the centrality of justice for the gospel in the Old Testament as in the Beatitudes affect you? That is like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. How were you raised? How does it come across to you? Even if you're on board, um, is there discomfort? Is there tension? Uh, how, are, how are you experiencing this? Not all of you were perhaps raised like I was, so it may be quite different. The black church is very different uh, than the white church on these issues. Uh, the second question, so I'll leave this up here, uh, what do we do now? How do we change deep-seated assumptions and biases? How do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Uh, this last uh, QR code is for uh, the bibliography you have on your table and a larger one as well if you're interested in, in looking further. So if you don't have many at your table, you might want to join another table. So I encourage you to start with discussion. And we'll go about, um, let's see, what do we have? About eight minutes or so, eight to ten, and then we'll have a chance for a large group if you want to report something from your table, you have a question that's come up or something like that, we'll have a large group time.
You all seem to be going very strong. We're going to run out of time here, stopping sharply at uh, 10:30. Is there any, uh, like, anything you'd like to share to the larger group from your smaller group? And I think we have a microphone here that could be used. To somebody Would anybody like to share? Oh. Um. We talked about bias, and, and I said, and I'm 88 years old, so I have more of it than most people do. <laughs> uh, okay, but uh, I, I can relate to that. I, I, I don't think that we ever get rid of our biases, but we don't have to act them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, can, we can live above. Some of the stuff that's still within. Right. You know, interestingly, uh, for some of you interested in contemplative prayer, one of the effects of contemplative prayer is to become much more aware of ourselves and what's going on in ourselves. And it helps just to be aware first. Yeah. Anyone else? I was chasing rabbits, but you talked about translations, so I went into my software and looked at the translations I have available. Of the English translations, only the New Living Bible says justice. Okay, good. And I have one Spanish version. My Spanish is rusty, but it did say hombre de justicia. Right. Good. And the message and good news were more appetite for what God says. They got away from both words. Okay, okay. Good research. I think were you wanting to, uh, up here? Oh. I was wondering if we should put Humpty Dumpty back together anyway. Uh, and why was he on the wall? And so uh, what put him there? Uh, so, okay, okay. But I do think uh, what was said earlier is uh, there's a thing called fooey in family uh, um, work. And that is uh, family of origin impacts everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we get rid of it, as was said earlier, uh, that uh, like the biases, we, we, we have to identify them, and then we have to recognize that we're choosing a different route, and we have to choose it. And I think that is part of the next step for many of us, is to get in touch with the biases we do have as we can learn them, and then do something uh, choose to do something else. Yeah, yeah. I think that is a, it's a big point that when I was first teaching, 
I had this great idea that I would come in and give a great lecture and convince everyone, and then they were convinced, and then the next day we would go to the next thing. Put that behind. <laughs> and I found that it doesn't work that easily. Uh, and it often takes going over and over things again and again. Is that it? Well, that's probably a good place to stop right now. Mary. Or Oh, Mary, okay. I just like to say, you know, just as I like to say that also you have to, uh, it's not an easy thing to do because you have to forgive people. And then it doesn't make, because you forgive somebody, that you forget what they've done to you or what, how, how they treated you or whatever. But uh, well, I think for me, for example, it took me a long time to forgive what people had done. But I, I forgive them, but then again, I know what, I, I don't forget what they've done to me or what they've said to me. But I forgive them because it's, it's just a, I, I forgive, but I don't forgive. That's another good example of the hard work that's involved. Okay. Thank you. We recognize we have a hard stop today at 1030 because of those joining us online. I hope that you will join me in thanking Dr. Stiver for this wonderful very uh, concise way of helping us pr think about our own theological place and what it is that we are up against, not only out there, uh, but also in here as well. Uh, as, as you were talking, Dr. Stiverin did so excellently. Um, I thought to myself, now I know why uh, not one but two seminaries that he has been a part of have had their, their challenges uh, from evangelicals. Uh, because of the truth telling and uh, what is presented in such a powerful kind of way and really eye opening kind of way. So um, we have been blessed with a rich uh, treasure here in Dr. Stiver and uh, we're really, really grateful. Next Sunday, we will be back in here again uh, where we will be, uh, we will have the opportunity to hear from some guests regarding. Um, issues of justice more, more local, uh, r around issues of justice within our own Tarrant County Jail, and uh, really thinking about that biblical call um, to visit the prisoner, um, to recognize that Jesus uh, is, was himself uh, wrongfully incarcerated and uh, brutally, brutally treated while um, while under interrogation and uh, under apprehension. And so it's appropriate that we come and think about things uh, more locally. And I'm so grateful for Dr. Stiver having given us this biblical framework to say justice and righteousness and evangelism are all bound up together. So thank you so very much. God bless you all. Uh, hope you'll come back next week. <laughs>